much of the art that we've been working f with is uh, loaned to us or given us, we're given access to it by the nuns of Ivingen in Germany. And each one of the slides is about 10 gigabytes. So that means that we can um, use it in our work in the planetarium and that we can zoom in without excessive pixelation. Um, so I hope you'll be able to get a little bit of a sense of the, of the clarity of the, of the visuals and realize that it's not quite uh, like what you find on the internet. So many are the ways in which the digital age affects and will affect musicology. Databases that allow rapid mining for the answers to questions, a vast array of primary sources online, manuscript fragments, autographs, early editions, sheet music, letters, I could go on and on. Figuring out how to cite such things is the biggest problem we sometimes have. I have to try to help my students and help myself learn how to cite some of these things. My own list of, uh, of digitized manuscripts is now 25 pages long, and I haven't revised it lately. Technological expertises of many kinds are in play, but the most important thing, I think, is if you're interested in doing technology, and so many of us are now, um, to let the use of, of technological things that you have rise out of the particular repertory that you work with. Um, choose what is best suited to research and to the particular presentation that you may be uh, engaged in. One team of scholars is reconstructing the soundscape of St. Paul's London in the early 17th century, and I've seen them give digital presentations on this work. They're trying to figure out how people could actually hear a sermon, how they could actually hear the music of a procession, what it would be like to, to be there and try to figure out. And um, of course, with such work, we are uh, trying to understand how much could you know and how much couldn't, couldn't you know uh, as singers faced a listener uh, or didn't. And here we're working with what it is that art historians call the beholder's portion. And uh, that is so in when it comes to music. How do uh, and are we studying not only what is perceived, but also the actions of receiving and of perceiving, the inner workings of the musical imagination, which is so of such great interest to, uh, to so many people now, it has to do, of course, with matters of cognition that so many of us are working on. Many digital projects hold special interest to medievalists because we deal as a matter of regular concern with materiality and its meanings and manipulation. Our own project on Hildegard of Bingen is being shared now with a team of scholars in England who are working on Robert Grosstest and his understanding of the cosmos. At Notre Dame, we have a, a, a wonderful uh, uh, model of Kepler's universe, but we haven't put the music to it yet, and we hope to do that in the future. Musicologists in all areas have been occupied with media matters in recent decades, in art music and, of course, in ethnomusicology, in our study of film music, and in the recreation of music for moving images. But the tools for both recreation and for understanding situations and context are changing, becoming ever sharper as a result of technology. Every year we can do more, but to what avail? For many of us who do digital work, including those of us who study the Middle Ages, scholarship has grown increasingly bifurcated. And I know this was true in my own work. I often felt like I was divided in half, and half of me was in the library chasing down footnotes, and the other half in the field, uh, shooting or in the studio, working uh, on films, documentary projects. Um, and I thought, you know, it's hopeless. I'll never bring the two together. Um, would the one, I would ask myself, ever, ever inform the other? And enter Hildegard. She has her ways, and many of them relate to drawing a multiplicity of ideas and methods into a whole. And so the two parts of my scholarship have come together with concentration upon her. She is a unique individual, as Anne was saying earlier, uh, and I'm sure you realize this, but I, I will just review. She is the only, <laughs> because it's such a great list, she, she is the only major theologian in the Western canon who was also, also a first-rate composer. That is a composer whose works survive and can be securely attributed. 
She is the first known female composer in the Western world with a major repertory, once again, we should rem remind ourselves, of securely attributable works. She is a poet of the first order who also wrote a unique play, The Order Virtutum, the only play that survives with related illuminations, the context of a major theological treatise, and work that is fully noted and completely transcribable. In addition, Hildegard was a preacher, and fundamentally a teacher, and a leader of a large community for which she secured land, endowments, and planned buildings. She was learned in medicine, notably in traditional folk medicine, and probably attended to her community's medical problems, as well as to those of people who came to the monastery for help, especially women. And then she was a correspondent. Nearly 400 of her letters survive, carefully organized for reading by herself and her secretary, Vollmer, and they were not above uh, adding letters in their own uh, concoction if a particular idea was not forthcoming. Um, one might well stop there, but we have not yet come to today's topic, and that is Hildegard the composer artist. For although my position is both revisionist and controversial, I believe that this is what she was, and fundamentally so, that is fundamentally a composer artist. Many of the ideas discussed today were developed through engaging in digital work, in reconstruction and recreation from out of her theological, visual, poetic, and musical materials, itself a kind of research into medieval material culture, especially as found in Hildegard's monastery in the middle decades of the 12th century. A reoccurring point of discovery relates to how the various details of her multimedia creations are parts of wholes, at least if one works decade by decade. This interconnectedness applies especially when studying music, chant texts, and art together in her oeuvre, and relating them to creation and cosmos. There are not many inconsistencies. Rather, Hildegard's many manifestations of her ideas support each other, and one learns a great deal from putting them together in ways that our digital work allows. It is not, in the long run, so different from writing about something that is not fundamentally written, but rather is seen and heard. In digital work, we can combine the visual and sonic, but use the written descriptions as our guides. The processes that underlie Hildegard's making of art and music are related, and what links them is Hildegard's imaginative theology. What is more, Hildegard was a three-dimensional thinker who set her images in motion through her descriptions of them and who designed her vast set of images with layers that demonstrate her three-dimensional mindset. Her imagination was filmic. Her images move and they interlock. And she lacked only the technology to present them that way. So in the model Christian Yara and I are creating at Notre Dame for the Digital Visualization Theater, a state-of-the-art planetarium, we interact with Hildegard the composer and the nuns who we believe worked with her as copyists, and we think as artists and scholars. And they too were a community of song. And we worked with a group of singers, students at Notre Dame, to create the music. And that was the first stage in our work. And so, we engage with them, studio to studio, as it were. And we feel that from this process, we understand better how they worked, and the nature of the materials they created, and the ideas they wished to put forth. We are making a model of the cosmos as Hildegard understood it in the 12th century. To do this, we lay out the stages of creation, including the fall of Satan, and then after this, the fall of humankind, and then we spin out her moving, sounding cosmos, fully zoomable with all its parts. It is not yet ready. <laughs> but it will be in March, in time to be shown in our planetarium at a meeting of the Medieval Academy at Notre Dame. The 
decade of Hildegard's activities we concentrate upon is the earliest, Hildegard in her 40s and early 50s, the time in which she wrote her first major treatise, Scivias, short for Know the Ways of the Lord by a Simple Person. Complexities abound, for the copies we have of it made in her own scriptorium are all later by around two decades from the time we think she finished writing the book, that is, in the early 1150s. The most important of these manuscripts for our purposes is Wiesbaden I, which I have discussed in a recent JAMS article, and I will merely review briefly here the circumstances surrounding it, and I must do so, for it is the basis of our research and of our digital model. Wiesbaden I is the only surviving, and that should be in scare quotes, illuminated manuscript produced in Hildegard's scriptorium during her lifetime. Or at least we can say for sure that the scribes are nuns from Hildegard's scriptorium. The nuns of the Rupertsburg, Hildegard's monastery, were not manuscript painters, as can be told from what survives of their output. But the manuscript was superbly decorated with numerous full-page paintings. And one of the problems is coming to understand how it was that these artworks were designed and executed, a major issue for which I will propose a solution in the conclusion of this talk. And you see it's been a major problem because the, uh, the artwork has been, it's been said of the artwork that it had nothing to do with the nuns uh, and with Hildegard because they weren't manuscript painters. And so that's been on our minds very much as we've been doing this work. Wiesbaden I was taken to Dresden for safekeeping in World War II, and it has not been seen since. Because a few manuscripts that were in its same bunker did emerge after the war, some people think it still exists, perhaps in an attic somewhere in Russia. Who knows? In any case, we must at least for now think of it as lost. It was a deluxe codex copied on vellum, and there were 37 illuminations that are not quite like anything else made in the 12th century. What we have to work with, then, is not this precious and unique codex. Instead, we have black and white photos of the original, and also the extraordinary copy made by hand on parchment by and under the supervision of the nuns of Ibingen in the late 1920s, an exact duplicate that provides us with the colors and a direct copy made from the original, reflecting close study of the various techniques of drawing employed in the original. How they made this manuscript is a story not yet told. That they made it, or had it made, is not a matter of doubt. This fortunate set of circumstances means that we can know a great deal about Hildegard's original painted Scivias, even though the manuscript is apparently lost. And music and drama relate directly to the book, for Hildegard had the text of 14 of her songs copied into the treatise as part of its argument, as well as a shortened version of her play, Ordo Virtutum. The music for the chants and dramatic texts survive in two manuscripts contemporary with the illuminated Scivias. These manuscripts also made at the Rupertsburg and copied by nuns under the supervision of Hildegard and her secretary, Vollmer. The music fascicle of Wiesbaden Manuscript II a codex, and a codex now in the Belgian monastery at Dendermond. We cannot date them precisely, although the Dendermond Codex, on your right, was sent to the Cistercian monks of Villers Abbey, the ruins of which are in present-day Belgium, by 1173, when they acknowledge receipt of it in a letter. The music fascicle is incomplete, some folios having been lost, and this is the older of the two collections. In some respects, it probably comes closer to the various labelli from which these compilations were made. It seems that Hildegard's works were in a state of constant revision and flux within the scriptorium. That's one of the reasons I think I resonate with her. And that this accounts for the great variation in surface details that exist within the sources, the two music manuscripts included. I have made the transcriptions of music featured in our model from the Wiesbaden Codex, as it includes the Ordo Virtutum, and some phrases of it are used in our work. It is the only 12th century copy of the play. We 
know that Hildegard sang, probably as she worked to set text to melodies, and the manuscripts suggest that there was a revision going on in the scriptorium. Hildegard was the first composer we know of to have all of her works carefully organized into collections under her auspices and copied in pitch secure notation. There is firm evidence that two other such compilations existed from her scriptorium, which are now lost, which would give us a total of four. The degree to which she knew and was dependent upon the traditions of music theory operating in her region and in her time have been much studied, most recently by Jennifer Bain, who shows that although her compositions are unusual and somewhat idiosyncratic, they are well grounded in contemporary theoretical understanding. Hildegard mentions the monochord and the Guidonian hand, and she clearly composed using the Menarie, pairs of scales that allow for exploration of the full tessitura of pairs of plagal and authentic scales. She also delighted in trans transposition of one melodic phrase to various other pitch levels, usually as a way of developing her musical ideas and underscoring text. Transposition allows her to write in tonal areas besides those of D, E, F, and G. The sequence for St. Matthias, about which I have written, is a fine example of her transposing style and the ways in which she uses transposition to generate musical material. Other information about Hildegard's compositional processes are suggested by her portrait, which is apparently, if she designed it as I believe, the first selfie we have of a composer <laughs> in the Western musical tradition. It can be seen that she wrote on wax tablets and that Vollmer is depicted ready to copy from them onto parchment. It may be that she dictated the melodies to him to write down, for we don't know if she knew musical notation or not, but clearly he did, and trained the nuns in Hildegard's scriptorium to copy music. Hildegard designed her portrait to put herself in parallel with Gregory the Great, whom she would have believed created the chants she and her community sang every day in the mass and office. This strategy lent great authority to her new compositions and to the divine inspiration that was their source with Gregory. He had a, had a dove, so to quote, quote Henry Parks is getting a tweet, representing the voice of the Holy Spirit, and Hildegard had the living light, receiving a flash, the source of her visions and their accompanying music. And what did she hear when deep in thought? For her visions were, I believe, a mode of thinking under divine inspiration. Much of our information comes from her own letters and the biography, portions of which she certainly wrote herself. That's another thing we could have listed. The music she heard came in the form of wordless melismas, and these were remembered by her. She then set text to the melodies so they could be sung on feast days in church. Her chants, then, are progele, texts fitted to pre-existing melodic phrases, and this fact accounts for many of their features. Melismas are reused, expanded upon, transformed in many of her chants. Hildegard commonly composed in melodic couplets whatever kind of chant she was writing. So her phrases are readily detachable from the various fabrics into which she weaves them, building texts that reshape them each time they occur. New pieces of music were often brought into the medieval liturgy by composers and liturgists, along with some sort of creation story to justify their inclusion. In addition, the belief that humans must of necessity have words set to the textless songs of the angels is of major importance in the medieval Western tradition. So, for Hildegard to hear wordless melismas within a prayed set of visions, and then to put texts to these melismatic melodies are compositional strategies with a long history. Hildegard's sense of the angels is very complicated and lies at the heart of her musical hermeneutic. Hildegard says of chant in Scivias, quote, for the words symbolize the body, and the jubilant music indicates the spirit, and the celestial harmony shows the divinity, and the words for the humanity of the Son of God. Images, she believes, and writes about a great deal, are actually ideas from the divine intellect, 
put forth for human understanding. Likewise, sounding music with words makes textless sounds come forth clothed for comprehension by human intellect and ready to be sung. And so in our model, as you will hear, we sometimes use the melisma in a wordless form, and sometimes we put text to it, and we're taking Hildegard's ideas about her musical composition um, and embodying them when we do that. To demonstrate how these various understandings of Hildegard's materials relate to our digital model of the hexameron, or six days of creation, I have divided this short discussion into of the opening of our model into three parts. First, the gathering of the matter of the universe. Second, the action of the first day of Genesis, that is the creation of light and the angelic hosts. And third, the fall of the light bearer, Lucifer, originally the brightest of the angels and of his minions. This part of our model, which you will see, will unfold in just under five minutes. The first chant we have been studying and adapting for our model is Laus Trinitati, an antiphon in praise of the Trinity, the force creating the cosmos. As the chant appears only in the Dendermond Codex, it is perhaps an early work. In the text, as in Hildegard's other discussions of and depictions of the creation of the cosmos, the Trinity is the ultimate creative force. Here gendered female, as you can see, as the noun Trinitas is a female noun, and so a creatrix. The praise given to the Trinity in this antiphon is the work of the angelic hosts, created in the beginning of the process itself, as they are pure light. To make our model of the beginning, we have taken the first line of this chant and adapted it, beginning with the interval of a fifth and working out from there. Our complete model will unfold in a presentation that is no longer than 30 minutes total, and so we can feature only phrases of the several chants we have chosen, primarily because in their texts, Hildegard has underscored directly the ideas unfolding in the model. In fact, all of our ideas have been generated out of the chant texts. Also, the sense of time in a planetarium is very different than real time. It is slower because many of the images spin, so you have to think of this whole room filled with surround a sound and with spinning angels. And if you have that, you have to go at a certain speed because the spinning will make you and your audience sick. <laughs> and there are no barf bags on the backs of our chairs. So we have been seeking a workable inner grammar that suits both the visual and the musical. When you see, what you see today will not allow for the images to fill the entire room, um, but they will be, and we have a new verb that we use, it's called domified. <clears throat> and uh, we have pretty good sound, but we don't have 22 speakers, which is what we have in the planetarium. So I'm showing you flat images and relatively flat sounds uh, of something that really must be shown in the planetarium for its full effects. Our work will be readily adapted, not only to other planetaria, such as the one at Notre Dame, but for many others as well. We hope to take it to, uh, to Europe. And we are also making an application that will use the work. So this chant and this phrase uh, from Laus Trinitate is in E. And the text fits very well to the short melodic cells comprising the first long phrase. We'll sing it. Let's divide you in half. So this will be choir A from the, from the aisle this way, and this will be choir B. And so we'll sing it, although it wouldn't have been done this way, we'll sing it antiphonally. Um, and you can see that I've marked the phrases for you. So we'll, we'll sing one phrase, we'll sing the Laos phrase, and then you'll sing the Laos phrase, and then you'll sing the Trinitate phrase, and you'll sing the Trinitate. Because I think it would be very good for you to have this chant uh, in, your, in your minds before you, before you see uh, the, um, the image. You, you may not uh, have worked much with Hildegard's music, or maybe you have, I don't know. But one of the things that's most interesting about it is the way that she shapes melodic phrases along with the texts, because, of course, she's a poet as well as a composer. So, uh, I mean, sometimes it's, it's, it's 
it's strange and weird, but lots of times there are reasons for that. But with this particular uh, one, I think you can get the sense of, of how these cells uh, of text and music work together. <clears throat> are you gonna blow that pitch pipe? I told somebody in an elevator someplace that we were going to do this at this conference. They said, people are actually going to sing? <laughs> I said, of course they will. <laughs> the reason for choosing this music for the first stage of creation in our model are many. Primary among them is the text Hildegard chose, naming the Trinity as the creative force of all things and praising its powers. This idea is embodied within the image she designed for Scivias 2.1, which includes her hexameron. Here, a civil, silver prong is seen descending from the Trinity into the dark and formless void, and as a result, the stages of creation unfold. The prong represents the second person of the Trinity, the son who creates at the beginning of time in Hildegard's model, and again at the time of the Gospels. The Trinity is a vast spinning wheel, seen here at the opening of Scivias 1, but also at the opening of Scivias 2.2. Hildegard describes the creative act as follows. And the atmosphere suddenly rises up in a dark sphere of great magnitude. This is the material of creation, while still formless and imperfect, yet not full of creatures. It is a sphere, for it is under the incomprehensible power of God, which is never absent from it. And that flame hovers over it like a workman and gives it one blow after another, which strikes sparks from it until that atmosphere is perfected and heaven and earth stand fully formed and resplendent. The matter of creation, then, lies on a vast anvil, and the triune God is a smith with the second person of the Trinity working as the hammer. The act of creation is filled, potent with dramatic power, Genesis writ anew through the force of Hildegard's visionary imagination. We created the voids out of the threads of dark matter that Hildegard sp spun in Scivias 2.1, the slide I showed earlier, and we have her vision of the triune wheel move forth to strike the matter with its first blow, that of Genesis 1, when the basic shape of the universe, like a huge dark sphere, formed with one blow. To make this, we used a darkened form of the cosmic egg the shape we will slowly bring to life in the planetarium. So now we'll um, spin just a little bit of this and you can see the coming of the threads that are being created and the coming of the Trinity and the first whack on the sphere.
on the first day we offer a second blow of the hammer. That is the point when light is made and is separated from darkness, a very important moment in Hildegard's theology, involved as it always is with creation and falling. It is represented in the first roundel of Hildegard's hexameron, as you can see here in the top left corner. We have used Hildegard's cosmic egg from Scivias 1-3 as our model, and from here on out, our work is to build it stage by stage using Hildegard's hexameron from Scivias 2-1 and her chant texts and scientific treatises as guides. We are looking here at a model of the cosmos as understood by astronomers in the 12th century, but with theological overlay, which was also typical of the times. And this is so much like Hildegard. You look at any of these wind charts and models of the planets, and you see something that looks like that. And then you look at her cosmic egg, and it's like, what was she thinking? And her music is like that, too, because she takes forms that we know very well, hymns, sequences, responses, and she just sticks the stick of dynamite in, lights it, and lets it blow. <clears throat> and that's just what she likes. That's what she's like in everything that she does. Clearly, Hildegard knew wind charts and the kinds of maps of the planets that appear in treatises from the period. This example is from an English treatise, and it's contemporary with the time that the illuminated Scivias was produced in the 1170s. Light appears as the undistinguished fire surrounding the entire cosmos, and that's what you can see here, with angels as a part of it. We have created this concept in two ways. First, by showing the dark turning sphere, the cosmos, which you saw a moment ago, suddenly illuminated through the blow of the creator's hammer. And then by zooming inside the fiery shell to watch the angels appear rank by rank. We have used the details of the fiery shell Hildegard supplied to cover the sphere we've made. And this is possible because of those high resolution photographs generously supplied for our work by the nuns of Eibingen. They allow us to zoom in on details with absolute clarity. As has been seen in Hildegard's painting of the hexameron, the creation of light is synonymous with the creation of the angels, the heavenly beings that are pure light. So we, following her instructions, depict the angels as the first created living things, lights that need to have artistic representations so humans can understand them paired with chants so humans can hear them, for they are creatures who sing but without words. They spin out in nine ranks and fill the page of one of Hildegard's paintings as they gaze on the brilliant mirror of the divinity in the center of the array. They will fill the entire dome of the planetarium and they will circle in one by one as we sing uh, the appropriate antiphon. You may notice when you see them that we have spun two of the ranks together, but we will not do this in the final model. For the creation of light, which includes the creation of the angels, we use Hildegard's great antiphon in praise of the angels, O gloriosissimi, lux fifens angeli. The text of this antiphon is a kind of theological matrix for our entire work, for in it, Hildegard describes the creation of the angels, the fall of some of the angels at the start, and the fact that this fall made room in the angelic hierarchy for a new kind of creature, one that would also fall from the effects of the pride of Satan. We chose the opening phrase to be repeated to represent the many ranks of the angelic hosts, and my colleague, Carmen Elena Tejas, created a little motet out of these phrases to sound when all ranks are present and spinning. The effect in the planetarium verges, verges on the dazzling, and we'll give you a taste of it here. There are never notes or phrases sung that are not Hildegard's own. According to what we understand of Hildegard, our task after we have displayed the angels must be to depict the fall of Lucifer and his minions, once the brightest angel in the heavens. His loss is human's gain in Hildegard's view. As he and his own fall, the light is sucked out of these death eaters back into the bosom of the creator God, where it will be preserved along with the power of song 
and ultimately given to new creatures, human beings. You can see up in the corner there, that bright sphere sucking the light out of those falling angels. As Satan occupies a place in the cosmos, as Hildegard depicts it, we have created first the outer fiery shell that surrounds the cosmos, and then the dark membrane just below it that is the realm of nothing, the kingdom of vice. The two make for epic storms, the light and dark battle for human souls that rages in Hildegard's theological universe and will do so until the end of time. You can see the surrounding flames that we are making, and this will cover our, our whole surrounding sphere. And then you can see the dark area uh, against it. And these are the two forces that whack against each other in Hildegard's view of the cosmos. And she thinks that every single action that a human person makes creates the universe to shudder um, through the effects of, of, of this uh, ongoing battle. So we show the angels after their array as transforming into the vibrant tongues of fire that make up the fiery outer shell of the universe, the shell from which the stars and planets will be generated a bit later in further days. And then we show the sparks of light descending from this shell into the dark membrane below, which also, Hildegard says, quote, spins and turns like a wheel. But all the light is taken back preserved as it cannot be destroyed, and these former angels will lie with dark stones, piles of vices in this kingdom of nothingness. Hildegard's image of Satan shows him defecating the stones that will become vices, and that will form the stinking layer of space junk into which fallen humans will go. For the music of Lucifer's fall, we chose Hildegard's phrase describing this event from her antiphon for the angels. It is a dramatic line, and the text in translation reads, quote, whence he writhing plunged into ruin. The many S's in the Latin phrase make for a kind of hissing sound in the text that is mirrored by the twisting, falling, melodic line. What's it got in its pockets? <laughs> She, Hildegard's music is filled with tone painting, and we wanted this example to help us make the point of the theological importance in the fall for the cosmos Hildegard is depicting, both its creation and after we have completed, and, and it spins in its post-lapsarian, post-incarnational splendor. So now we'll play the whole opening from the first coming of matter to the creation of lights and angels to the fall of Lucifer and his minions. I wonder if we might turn it up just a slight bit so you hear that opening again.
taken license. Every person or team of people who creates music from the past does this. But we use Hildegard's materials in our work, and to that degree, we're faithful to them. And we use her ideas as the foundation for everything we do. The result is art and music within a digital display based on really painstaking research, just as an edition or a performance based on an edition would be. This is not something new. It is the nature of the materials Hildegard created and the tools we are using that make it somewhat different from most other things. But there's no claim for authenticity here. We are on a research mission through recreation using technology and our work has led us to think about how Hildegard and her team worked to create such an interrelated body of materials, of art and of music. As I said in the opening, the problem has been with how it is that women who were not painters came to have a major painted manuscript. Surely it was a male atelier that painted these works. Yes, we think that's probably true. For we know that bands of traveling craftsmen did work of this sort, of painting, of glazing, and of sculpture in this period in Germany. But did they design these carefully wrought works, so utterly related to every nuance of Hildegard's thought and music and poetry? No. The women must have done the work. And over time, so how? We realized one day, deep in thought, over this issue, that the images are made of threads, of appliques, of cloth, of stitches. For many reasons, the images grew from being first designed and worked as embroidery, we believe. We know the nuns of Rupertsburg were dedicated weavers and needleworkers. A passage from Hildegard's contemporary mentions a room for weaving at the Rupertsburg, another of their embroidering in the cloister. We have one enormous deluxe effort surviving from their shop, the Rupertsburg Antipendium created in around 1220, over a generation or so after the death of Hildegard. I have seen it in person and examined it during the whole of an afternoon, and I know its spectacular effects and the brilliance of its program. Multiple small threads emerging from the halos of the figures which include a Hildegard portrait prove that the gold and silver outlined figures against the red silken ground were once studied with small seed pearls. The stitching is not unusual, but the materials and the design are, as are the expense and effort that the work required. Needlework mattered at the Rupertsburg, as indeed it did in virtually every German convent, as the astounding display of craft remaining from the nuns in the museum at Wienhausen prove yet today. There are thread-like and applique-like features everywhere in the design of the painted skivias. The alternation of dark and light patterns reminds the eye of Klosterstich, especially if one looks at the way that the darkness of chaos is depicted, or clouds and sometimes water. There is not time to work here the threads of this argument, but you can see Klosterstich up in that uh, left-hand corner. You can also see how they made the star stitches, and they use those throughout the Rupertsburg Antipendium. They're also a common feature of the paintings of Hildegard Skivias. So as I say, there's not time to work the threads of this argument, but they have been gathered and will be displayed in future study through close attention demanding, demanded by digital work. We believe that the illuminations are paintings made from embroideries created by the nuns of the Rupertsburg under Hildegard's supervision. The treatise Skivias, then, is a Gesamtkunstwerk, offering a synthesis of several arts but with a theological purpose of instruction and one that requires supplementing through a communal memory well stocked with Hildegard's liturgical chants. One could re re recreate any part of the work and find music and sometimes drama to play alongside the visuals, as the treatise is hundreds of pages in length with 37 complex illuminations. This could inspire a medieval ring cycle of epic proportions. <laughs> but to do this work, or any part of it, calls not just to technology but it calls to technology in partnership with the work of traditional musicology, analysis, performance, close study of sources, and the kind of art history 
that demands long looking at art in the context of the history of those who made it and their reasons for doing so and their ways of doing so. Technology offers both tools and it also offers new ways of combining things not joined before to make new things and advance ideas and understanding. Such work requires interaction between digital artists, performers, scholars, specialists in the use of computers, and for us, the work of astronomers, specialists with software in modern planetaria. Few of us will ever have the time or training to be expert in all the many aspects of our various sorts of digital work. Digital modeling is not easy, and to do it, you must figure things out. But you have to figure them out as a team in fundamental ways, so it can suggest new models for collaborative work in the humanities. And for me, that has been the best thing about it. Thank you.